Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. I'm here talking about Dagger. My name is Jake Wharton. I work for Square. Uh, if you're not familiar with Square, we are a company that does open source Android development. And on the side, we process tens of billions of dollars in credit card transactions to make it to profit. So uh, first off, if you are a tweeter or G pluser, uh, please uh, include the following hashtags. I promised my girlfriend that there would be pictures from this, so if you take a picture, please include these hashtags. <laughs> uh, all right. We are here to talk about, once the slide finishes, we're here to talk about dependency injection. Once it finishes, there we go. So uh, dependency injection is something that every single one of you have in your app, whether you know it or not. Uh, as I, I was sad to see that Chet didn't include it in his patterns talk, but it is a pattern. It requires no libraries to use. And so what this pattern actually does is it separates the behavior of a class from uh, its required classes to perform the behavior. So as an example, if we have a class that's a tweeter, the tweeter depends on, say, a Twitter API wrapper, which in turn then depends on an HTTP client. So what would this look like in code? A relatively naive implementation of this would be uh, a class that creates an instance of this Twitter API and calls post tweet whenever I want to tweet. Our Twitter API would create an HTTP client and make the uh, necessary connection. And to use this, we would just instantiate it and post a tweet. So uh, hopefully you're looking at this and you're thinking that this is really poorly coded, because it is. So let's clean it up a little. We'll start with the Twitter API class. Uh, it's very obviously being wasteful, because it's creating an HTTP client every time we call it. So very easily, we can pull that out into a field. Uh, what makes this a little better, uh, or what would make this a little better, rather, is if we were to pull this out into the constructor and pass in the OKHTP client. Because this allows us to, say, customize it, install a disk cache, configure SSL, whatever. So let's move on to uh, the tweeter class. So now we know that we are passing in our OKHTP client. So let's include that when we instantiate our Twitter API. Uh, and this is also being wasteful, because we see that it's creating a Twitter API instance every time we want to post a tweet. So very easily, we can do the same thing, pull this out into a field. Very standard refactors to, to optimize this. Uh, the username is hard-coded, which is something you obviously would never want to do. So we should take that in as a constructor argument. And uh, this technically becomes a dependency, uh, even though you might not think of it as one. Going back to our code, let's see what we've changed it to look like. Uh, we know we have to pass in now the username. Uh, code remains relatively the same, and we can go on tweeting to our heart's content. Uh, where this becomes a problem is if we have another class that has to interact with this Twitter API. So say we want to look at your timeline. Uh, here, we have, uh, here we have an example of what the timeline class might look like. Uh, it's doing very similar things. It's creating its own Twitter API, passing in a, a client. And it has the standard methods that you would need in order to uh, load more tweets and get a list of the tweets. So uh, very obviously, we are now creating two Twitter API instances with two different HTTP clients. So what do we do? We do the same thing we've been doing. We put this into something that uh, comes in via the constructor, and it becomes nice and clean. Over in our tweeter, we do the same thing, take it as a constructor argument. And now let's go back to our calling code. So how do we update our calling code in order to support our changes? Well, it goes from uh, something relatively terse to something that's a little more verbose. We now have a lot of work that we have to do to set up all these dependencies and pass them in appropriately. Uh, so to me, this becomes an uh, unacceptable amount of boilerplate. So going back to our little diagram here, we've taken uh, our simple linear uh, dependency tree and turn it into one that's a little bit more complex with the introduction of this timeline class. But we've introduced a lot of boilerplate. So how do we go about avoiding the boilerplate? Well, uh, we used to use Juice. Uh, Juice is a fairly prominent dependency injection framework. Uh, all of our back-end Java services have, have been using Juice. Uh, there's a lot of 
good hype and buzzwords about it. Uh, it's very well tested, powerful, dynamic, et cetera, et cetera. And it's pretty much the standard for dependency injection. However, uh, Juice has a couple problems, one of which is that any configuration uh, problems will occur at runtime. So uh, you might start your app, you know, get a couple screens in, and then realize that you didn't provide a dependency properly, and your app's going to crash. Additionally, it is very slow to initialize. It's uh, slow to inject uh, on relative terms. Uh, this is talking, I guess, in the scope of Android. And there's also certain memory problems that it introduces. Uh, and then you get a bunch of people complaining about it, like this fine gentleman who managed to tweet about five minutes before my presentation. Uh, injection frameworks on Android have traditionally been viewed as these very uh, cumbersome, slow things that cause problems. So we at Square sought out to change that, and we uh, began working on something that was called the object graph. And so some of its goals, uh, we wanted static analysis of all your dependencies. So we want to know everything in your application that's using uh, dependencies without having to run the application. We wanted to fail as early as possible. So if there's a missing dependency, uh, we want your build to fail, not your app to crash. This way, uh, it improves developer turnaround, get to skip dexing and deployment and all that stuff. Uh, no reflection. We wanted no reflection on methods, annotations, anything like that at runtime. Uh, Android's implementation of this has been traditionally very slow. And of course, negligible memory impact. So the development process of this object graph uh, was a five-week spike by Jesse Wilson. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, he worked on uh, Juice as well, Juice version 2. Uh, and he also worked on Dalvik and the core libraries for Android. Uh, Crazy Bob was technical advisor. Bob uh, led the JSR 330. Uh, it's the dependency injection standard in Java. Uh, and he also created the original version of Juice. So two very smart people. After about five weeks, we were able to get this into our applications, and we had this giant Boolean, uh, which enabled you to switch between Juice and Object Graph. And about two weeks after that, we were able to get rid of Juice completely. And then, of course, we renamed it to Dagger. So uh, a lot of people ask about Dagger the name, so I will quickly cover that. Uh, dependency tree in your uh, app might look something like this. It's not actually a tree, it's a graph, and it's a special kind of graph. You'll notice that uh, all of the arrows are pointing in a single direction, which means it's a directed graph, and you'll notice that there's no cycles, so nothing points to itself even transitively, which means it's acyclic, so this is a directed acyclic graph, and that's where dagger becomes dagger. So, uh, we've talked about dependency injection as a, a pattern now, and let's take a look at what Dagger gives us as a library. So there's three main things. Uh, the object graph class, this is the, uh, the, the center. This is the dependency manager, the repository of all the instances. Uh, we have what's called modules, and there's two annotations that you, two or three that you use with those. Uh, and this is the mechanism that you tell Dagger about dependencies. And there's uh, at inject, and this is the way that you request dependencies in your classes. And there's also a couple little uh, syntactic sugar and magic and other conventions that are, of course, come with the library. So how do we provide dependencies in this world of Dagger? Uh, we create these things called modules, and modules are just classes that uh, tell Dagger how to create instances of objects. We annotate these classes with a module, and this is so Dagger can find all of them statically. And then uh, we put the provider method on, or the provider annotation on the methods. And this is so um, Dagger can look at the return type of these methods and associate them with um, that, that type. So a module looks something like this. Uh, this is just the Java code for it. So like I said, we have to annotate it with module. And then on each one of these methods, which are, I hesitate to call them factories because they're, uh, that sounds a little enterprise-y, but these, this is technically a factory of instances. Uh, and this is what Dagger is going to use to create these. So we annotate it with provides. Uh, and I'm also going to toss on a singleton. I hope all you are familiar with the singleton pattern. It basically means create this and only create it once. And so internally, what Dagger is going to do 
uh, is basically it's going to map between the type and the method that creates that type. So we're going to have our OKHTP client and our Twitter API, and Dagger is going to uh, associate those with the uh, two methods that are inside of this class. And if you saw, which I forgot to highlight, the Twitter API method uh, also takes the OKHTP client as an argument. And so what Dagger is going to do, slow animations don't help when I have to jump around. What Dagger is going to do is it's also going to create a path between the Twitter API method and the OKHTP client type. So whenever a Twitter API is requested, it's going to follow this graph uh, transitively and start from the bottom and work its way up. The other thing about modules is that they're designed to be composed together. So we don't want just one module that lists everything in your app. Uh, we want multiple modules. So going back to our Twitter example here, we, have, uh, we provided our API and our HTTP client. Now we need to provide the higher level classes. So uh, let's provide our tweeter and our timeline. And you'll see that we're taking in the user as a constructor argument. So when we create this, we'll already have to have a user. Uh, and both of these depend on the Twitter API uh, type. So our map then becomes something like this when we add this module. So if we ever need to create a timeline, Dagger is going to follow that to the uh, method which creates the instance. And it's also going to see that it needs a Twitter API. It will go to that method, see that it needs an OKHP client, and then it'll work its way backwards constructing the instances. And because we have the singleton annotation, uh, it's only ever going to do that once. So we're now providing dependencies. How do we get those into our classes? Well, uh, like I said, we use the inject annotation. Uh, this is required. This is also uh, what Dagger uses for statically analyzing how your dependencies are used. We can only use field and constructor injection with Dagger. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Juice, but there's also um, method injection, which allows you to inject dependencies into method calls uh, that's not supported. Uh, let's start with constructor injection. Uh, so you can only have a single constructor that takes at inject. The arguments that that constructor takes are implicitly the dependencies that it requires. And the advantage of this is that because it's in the constructor, you can store those dependencies in private final fields. So if we have a tweeter app, uh, we can annotate its constructor, take in the tweeter and timeline, and then store those in private fields. Uh, and obviously, there would be other uh, method implementations below to, to actually run this app. Uh, two things about constructor injection. Dagger must create the object to do this. Since it's obviously the constructor, uh, it's the one that has to be doing the instantiating because it has to pass in the dependencies. And a clever little thing about this is that if you have an add inject on a constructor for a type, you do not have to include it in a module and provide it if something else is going to inject it. So because I have add inject on that constructor, I could now theoretically inject my uh, tweeter app into another class for free. So other than constructor injection, we have field injection. Uh, this is the one that's uh, most commonly used on uh, Android types, which we'll see. So you put at inject on the fields, and those fields must not be private or final because they have to be set by Dagger. And that looks a little something like this. Uh, we are now requesting our tweeter and our timeline as fields with the inject annotation on them. So uh, where you would use this is something like this on Android. Uh, it's useful for when the object is not created by you. Uh, so injection happens after the object has been instantiated. So this is a very common thing in Android. The platform is doing the instantiation of things like activities, services, etc. And oftentimes this means that you have to know about injection. Uh, you have to be able to inject yourself because uh, something else did the constructing. So we're providing dependencies. We're now requesting dependencies. How do we tie them together? And that's what the object graph is for. So this is the central manager of all the dependencies. Uh, and it's also our injector. So it is the thing that performs injection. 
The syntax for creating an object graph looks a little like this. Uh, it's a static method which allows you to create them and you pass in any number of modules. So like I said, these can be composed together so we can have uh, one or many. Uh, here we're creating our network module and the Twitter module which knows about our user. To request uh, dependencies, you can do it like this. This is for constructor injection. So this is if we wanted to get our original Twitter app that took dependencies in its constructor. And if we're using field injection and something else is instantiating the object, uh, we would use the inject method. And so this is going to go and uh, set values on those fields. One cool thing about the object graph is that it can be extended to create uh, what's, what's known as scopes, if you're familiar with juice. Um, object graphs are inherently immutable, so you can't change them once they're created. But this allows you to add additional dependencies uh, into the graph by basically combining two together. So I'm gonna, this is our object graph that we created. I'm going to get rid of our Twitter module. And I'm just going to start with the network module. And I'm actually going to add a few more things that you would probably need. So say we need some kind of persistence. We need uh, interaction with some kind of account management. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this object graph to inject things that are common everywhere throughout the app. And then later on, whether it's uh, after your first activity has started or say somebody has logged in, we're eventually going to get a user, whether we query it from the account manager uh, or they explicitly logged in. We're going to get this user. And we need to add those uh, tweeter and timeline objects into our graph so that we can use them. So what we're going to do is use another method on object graph called plus. And this is what we're going to do to combine two graphs together. Uh, we're going to create one implicitly by passing in our Twitter module, and then we're going to add it onto the original object graph. And so this is where we would inject things that require the user. So our, our logged in activities and such would use this object graph to inject itself. To showcase a little more what that looks like, uh, oops, I got a click. So we have our, our network module here, which has our two uh, network related dependencies. We have our persistence and account module, whatever is inside them. And we wrap them up in the uh, app object graph, the, the graph that's global. And so later on, we're going to get our user, and we're going to instantiate the user model. And when we plus it, it's going to take the original graph and uh, add the user module and any other modules that we add into this uh, superset that contains both the original object graph and the new modules that we add in. So later on, if the user, say, logs out, all we have to do is throw away that user object graph. We still have the one that maintains all the other dependencies. Uh, but when the user's out, we can simply throw away that graph, and all the dependencies associated with it will go away. And then, say, if somebody else logs in, or the user logs back in themselves, uh, we do the same operation. We plus on these additional modules. So before I go any further, uh, let's bring Android a little more into the mix here. So Android's uh, entry objects are managed, and they're constructed by the OS. So this is things like activities, services, uh, fragments. All of these things uh, are constructed by Android. And they all usually require some kind of shared state. Uh, so the logged in user, things like that. Uh, the platform itself is traditionally extremely difficult to test. Uh, dependency injection as not only a pattern, but using a library uh, is a very, uh, very big aid to that, to simplify how you can test your app. Additionally, the uh, new Gradle-based build system is extremely dynamic and allows for multiple flavors and build types. And this lends itself to uh, doing dependency injection and finally, there's, there's many libraries out there which require you to follow patterns like uh, the singleton pattern uh, just to keep track of, of state and these long-lived objects. So if we go back to our object graph, uh, what we do in Android is we traditionally create this on an application subclass. Uh, there's a couple of reasons we do this. It's implicitly itself a singleton. Android will only ever create one. And it's also the first object that's created. So uh, you can instantiate the object graph before any of the activities, fragments, services, et cetera, uh, will require injection. 
And so this is an example of eagerly creating the object graph. You can also lazily create the object graph when it's first requested. Uh, we just put this on the application in its onCreate method. In our activities, we would do something like this. Uh, we'll get back to our, our Twitter example in a second here. Uh, in our ap activity, we need to basically find the object graph and then inject ourselves. So this is where I said that uh, field injection traditionally requires you knowing about injection. But uh, what we normally would do would be push this code down into a base activity so that you only have to write it once and never have to look at it. And so uh, one of the ugly points of Dagger that I kind of glossed over, I have to address at this point, and that's listing your injection points. So as you saw in my activity, I was injecting two fake classes of foo and a bar. Uh, this would actually, just in what I wrote, this would actually fail. Uh, it would fail at compile time. And that's because you have to tell Dagger all of the places that you are going to be injecting. And this is, again, for static analysis, because uh, things like Tweeter and the timeline, even though they, uh, nothing depends on them directly, they're not actually the leafs of this graph. The places that you are injecting are the leaves, and so that's where, Dagger, that's where Dagger needs to start its static analysis. So we have to tell it all these injection points. Like I said, uh, this is used for very aggressive static analysis. So we start here and then work our way outward. Uh, if we were doing full app compiles every single time, so um, you're basically including all the jars and all the raw Java files every single time you build your app, we probably wouldn't need this because all of the classes are available. However, that would be extremely slow, and most build systems do incremental compilation. And this means that we absolutely need these to know where to start because we can't just scan every single file. So where I would have a module that looks like this for our example, uh, we actually need to make it look like this. And this is where we are now listing our example activity at the top as an injection point. And so when Dagger is doing its static analysis, it can see that starting at example activity, uh, it's requesting foo and bar, and then it knows that it's in this module and can follow any transit dependencies and make sure they're all met. So that's typically how you use it on Android. Uh, we put our root object graph on the application object itself. Any object that's created by Android has to find that object graph using whatever means necessary and then inject itself. Uh, and we create multiple modules and list injection points. Uh, and this is a great way to segment different parts of your app. So if there's a account management section, there's our timeline section of the app, and there's our logged out section of the app. Those are three uh, separate modules, each with their own injects list. And so let's go back to plus to extending object graphs. And let's go back to our Twitter example. So like I said, this is how we add dependencies to the graph uh, and allows us to create scopes. So we're basically creating, in our Twitter example, a user scope, a scope that only exists when there's a logged in user. So like I said, uh, we create our object graph on the application object. Here we have our three example objects. In our activity, we're finding that. Uh, we're injecting ourselves in, say, a landing activity. Uh, we're checking whether or not we have a user already, and then, say, forwarding to the timeline activity. Otherwise, we'll show the traditional uh, login or sign up stuff. Uh, and remember, this is the injection itself, usually pushed into a base class, but for the examples of the slide, I have them here. So now, uh, in our timeline activity, we're doing something very similar. We're getting our object graph. We're checking whether or not we have a user, and if we do have a user, we're plussing that user and its modules onto the graph, and then using that graph to inject ourselves. Uh, this is another thing that you would probably want to push into a base activity. One thing that we, uh, one pattern that we've adopted is having a logged out base activity and a logged in base activity. And so uh, the logged in base activity would be doing this uh, user check and plussing of the graph for you. Uh, so let's look at a different example of plus that, that we use a lot. So I have my, my app here, my phone, and most of our screens contain an action bar. And underneath this action bar, we usually have some kind of view or fragment that's managing the view. 
And so we have, say, sign up. And then maybe the user clicks a button, and another viewer fragments inflated, uh, and it slides underneath the action bar and comes in. However, in doing so, the action bar needs to change. So both of these objects need to know about the action bar, but we traditionally don't want to give them uh, direct access to the action bar by calling into, uh, say, the activity directly, because that creates uh, a, a hard dependency on the activity. So what we would do in this case, uh, if we're using our signup example, we would create a module which is going to provide the action bar and takes in the activity uh, as part of its constructor. As you can see at the top, we're listing our injection points, so our, our two views. In our activity, uh, after creation, we are plussing our module onto the graph. And below here, we would be uh, instantiating the correct view or fragment and then injecting it. And so that allows our views to now just be able to inject the action bar directly and call, say, set title whenever it becomes attached to the window. Uh, and what this allows us to do is not have a direct dependency on the activity above it. We're not calling into that activity or even knowing about that activity. Uh, so we don't really know or care where that action bar came from. We just know that we need one. Okay. Another extremely useful feature of Dagger is what's called overrides. And overrides allow you to specify modules whose dependencies will override other dependencies in the graph. And so this only applies when you're in the same object graph. So if I'm providing, say, my tweeter, uh, and I want to override that, the modules both have to be in the same graph. I can't plus uh, a module that wants to override the tweeter into uh, another graph. And so where this becomes extremely useful is customizing for build flavors and build types. Uh, and also uh, for testing, both manual and automated. So let's go back to our, our timeline here. Uh, as you can see, we have two methods. Uh, we have our get method, which returns all the tweets that we know about, and we have our load more method, which uh, presumably is going to do background work to fetch more tweets. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a fake implementation of this. And uh, overrides, because we're providing uh, dependencies that are going to override others, they have to be of the same type. So this works really well with interfaces. We could have a mock timeline implement a timeline interface and then have, say, a real timeline. Uh, but it's not necessarily required, so here I'm just extending. I'm keeping a, a memory in-memory list of all these tweets. Uh, I'm adding in the constructor an initial tweet here uh, that actually wouldn't compile because the array list is uh, created after the constructor. But, um, and I'm also overriding the two methods. So the load more method now does nothing because this is just a mock implementation. Uh, and I've also added an add tweet method, which allows us to uh, put another tweet into our, our memory cache here of tweets. Our tweeter uh, has a single method tweet. And if we want to mock this out, we would do something very similar. You can see that I am injecting our mock timeline into the mock tweeter. And so this, is, uh, this allows us to put a tweet into the timeline whenever uh, the tweet method is called. So how would we provide this? It's a module like any other. Uh, we're injecting our mock tweeter and our mock timeline into these methods. Uh, if you remember when I talked about constructor injection, how we didn't have to provide dependencies that have add inject on a constructor. Uh, here's an example of that. So both mock tweeter and mock timeline have add inject on their constructor, so I can just in, uh, add them as dependencies and Dagger will figure it out. And so I've, I've included overrides true in my module, which means whenever I add this into an object graph, both the tweeter and timeline coming from this module are going to override the tweeter and timeline that exist in the uh, Twitter module. Creating the object graph would look like this if you were doing it manually. I have my network module for the low-level dependencies. I have my Twitter module for the tweeter and timeline. And now I'm tacking on my mock module, which is going to override the tweeter and timeline uh, from the Twitter module. Now, when we use this, uh, if you will assume that these are already injected, 
If we iterate over all the tweets that the timeline thinks it has, we're going to get the one from our mock user that we created in the constructor. And if we're going to post a tweet and then iterate yet again, you'll see that our tweet that we uh, injected into the mock timeline from the mock tweeter uh, is now showing up. And so if you, if you close your eyes and you imagine uh, taking this to the extreme, you can do this for your entire application. So we have something that we call mock mode in all of our apps. And what we do is we take this, uh, we take the overrides and we do it for every single network related uh, dependency and we override them. What we do is we provide alternate implementations of these which fake out the behavior. So anything that calls a network uh, is going to do, is going to have similar behavior, but it's all going to operate in memory running on the phone. And we include a bunch of fake images and fake data inside of these builds so that we can uh, show all this information and pretend like we're a real server. So if I'm in an app and I'm going to sign in, sign in with, say, my fake user, once we're logged in, we're going to get data that looks like this. Now, this is not real data. I can interact with this app. I can drill into merchants. Uh, this is Square Wallet, an unreleased version of Square Wallet. Uh, I can drill into these merchants. I can interact with them. I can sign up. I can go through the sign up flow, something we uh, never test and would be hard to test against, uh, would be annoying to test against real servers, creating all these fake accounts. So you can do everything in the app in this mock mode without ever hitting the network and without ever creating you know, a bunch of fake data on real servers. And the way that we do this, uh, using Gradle, of course, uh, is that we put a special class, which we call modules, just simply by convention. We put it in the release folder instead of the main folder. And all it does is have a single static method which returns a list of the modules that we want to include. So by default, we're just including the wallet module, which is going to be uh, transitively including a bunch of other modules from the app. And in our debug uh, build type, we're going to include the original wallet module because uh, the debug does include the, the main stuff. And we're also going to be adding on the debug wallet module, which only exists inside of this debug uh, build type. And now when we create our object graph inside our application, we simply have to refer to this class and call its static method to list the modules. Whether or not it's built as the release type or debug type, it's automatically going to get the right list, uh, and it's automatically going to add that functionality uh, whenever uh, in the debug type. So mock mode's great. Uh, it, one thing we wanted to do is take it even a step further. And we wanted to provide access to a bunch of different things that you would need in order to make mock mode truly useful. So we created something called the debug drawer. And what this does is this provides uh, quick access to uh, options and general information that you as a developer would want access to. And an advantage to this is that it's completely hidden from the normal UI. Uh, this is a big thing because a lot, of, a lot of apps have debug options in their development settings, but it, it has a tendency to mess up your UI. We used to uh, shove all of ours into the overflow menu. However, it would cause the overflow menu to appear on screens that it might not otherwise appear, something that uh, our designers absolutely hated. And so what we do is we put controls inside of this debug drawer to change the app's behavior. And so we're going to take a look at what that looks like. That looks like. We're going to use uh, Square Cache, our most recent app that we released. So uh, you can open the debug drawer by sliding, uh, doing a bezel swipe from the right of the screen. And it looks a little like this. So inside this, you'll see there's a bunch of controls. Uh, we can change, say, the endpoint that we're connecting to. We can change our log level, uh, the speed of animation. If I scroll down, you'll see general build information, the Git SHA when it was built, uh, device information. Things like that. Back up at the top, uh, you'll also see that there's some options for controlling the network. Uh, and these are actually grayed out. And so that's because we're, not, we're talking to our production server. We're not in mock mode yet. So this is a debug build of our app, but we haven't enabled mock mode. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. In the, oh, there we go. The app restarts in mock mode. 
uh, and now you can see all those controls are enabled. And what this allows us to do is change the behavior of the app talking to this in-memory server. So I'm going to change it so that it looks, uh, the server thinks that the, I'm sending an email to myself, or I'm sending cash to myself. And so when we get a response back, it's going to say, hey, you can't do that. And what's happening here is it's, it's existing only in mock mode. So our, uh, our cache API, uh, or the wrapper around it, has been overridden in mock mode. And it has a, uh, a field with an enum on it that controls the response type. And so now, when we're in mock mode, we can change how the server responds. And this allows us to test different failure cases. These failure cases are uh, extremely hard to test in real life because it requires you sending an email and then changing the behavior of the server. Uh, something that's very hard to coordinate. And now it's become extremely easy because we are injecting this API and we can now override that API's behavior. So let's switch it back over to success. And we should hopefully see that it, well, it's a video, so we'll definitely see that it succeeds. And so all of this is uh, made part by mock mode and being able to inject these things. The debug drawer is injecting all of the different mock uh, uh, implementations of the server, and the spinners and stuff are hooked directly up to its behavior. So we can now control how the server acts inside of the app without ever hitting the network, and allows us to reliably uh, test and evaluate different scenarios inside the app without having to worry about figuring out how to get the actual server to respond that way. And so this is also a great thing for instrumentation testing because it makes your app deterministic. You can control the behavior of the network without actually hitting the network. You can then write tests against your app because you know uh, every single time how it's going to behave, you know what data is going to be in the app because you're providing it, and you know what it's supposed to look like. So if you're capturing screenshots, uh, you can, over time, detect regressions and changes in the UI that, that aren't supposed to be there. So this is something that we've, all of our apps. Uh, so you'll, I showed you Square Wallet earlier. Uh, Square Register also has a debug drawer. However, it's, it's hideously ugly, so I didn't include it on the slide. Uh, and what I've gone ahead and done, because this is a, a concept that when I talk about is really cool and you think, oh, maybe I want to do this, uh, but you might not know how. So what I've gone ahead and done is created a sample app that I will be providing and allowing you guys to, to look at and see actually how sort of we have adopted this pattern and how we use this pattern to allow our apps to be testable both in a manual uh, and an instrumentation through instrumentation. So the sample app uses a bunch of different technologies, uh, a bunch of different libraries, both from Square uh, and myself, things that were uh, patterns and stuff that we're adopting through these. It will be available here. Uh, I am actually not, it's not 100% done. Uh, it'll probably be up tomorrow. I figured that finishing my slides was a little more important. Uh, so I'll, I'll blast out to you know, Twitter and Google Plus whenever it's available. Uh, but it's really cool, you should check it out. Even if uh, you're not familiar with dependency injection, a lot of our other libraries are used in there, uh, and it serves as a great sample of how to uh, combine all these things into a, a working application. So to start the end of my slides, uh, with dependency injection, there's, there's things that you should absolutely not do. And so one of those is don't just ignore the pattern itself. Uh, you don't have to use a library. I don't care if you use a library or not. Uh, the pattern itself, uh, even though it's, it's a pattern, uh, it, it allows you to, or it, it forces you to write better code, code that's better abstracted. Um, the pattern is also called inversion of control. Uh, and so this is something that will allow you to swap out implementations in the future without having to affect the code that uses those. Uh, do not make every class use the pattern. So a lot of things that we see is people leaning on both dependency injection as a, uh, through a library and as a pattern way too much. Uh, you do not have to inject everything. There is something to be said about having, uh, about removing layers of abstraction. Uh, it makes your code easier to read, easier to debug, and easier to write. Um, so, so find a, a good balance of what you need to inject versus what you should inject. 
Uh, and also, do not use static dependencies. Uh, Dagger does support static dependencies, uh, as does Juice, and it should be used extremely sparingly. Uh, we only have, I think, a single static injection in our app, uh, but if you can avoid it, or if you don't even know what it is, pretend like I didn't say anything, and don't ever try and use it. So I'm going to conclude with my favorite quote from the uh, Android developer site. And so that is, uh, avoid dependency injection. This is the title of this section on the developer site. And it says that using dependency injection frameworks like Juice and RoboJuice can be attractive. Uh, however, it leads to problems because they scan your code for all the annotations at runtime and load, uh, they mmap, they force your class, uh, they force Android to mmap your entire uh, code into RAM, even though it might not be used. And so you'll notice that uh, Dagger is not in this list. And this was written about three or four weeks ago now. So Dagger's been out for over a year. And there's a reason for this, that Dagger is not in this list. And that's because of all the things that I outlined on the goals. One thing that Dagger uses is uh, it's something called uh, an annotation processor. And through that, what it does is it actually generates code dynamically. So it uses the annotations that you put on both your modules and in your injections. Uh, it figures out everything about your app and its dependency flow, and it generates classes in order to fulfill those dependencies, so real code. And this happens automatically inside of Java C. You don't have to do anything to opt into this. Merely by having the uh, Dagger compiler on your class path, this is automatically going to run every time you build your project. And what this affords us is at runtime, there is no reflection on any fields, and there's no reflection on any methods. Uh, we do have to do a single uh, class forename lookup in order to load these classes because they're dynamically generated. But that is, of course, aggressively cached, and you only pay that penalty once, and it is extremely minor. The other beauty about this is that it's both uh, debugger and uh, you as a developer friendly. So if you've ever tried to debug a juice injection, uh, you know it's a nightmare. Uh, it's almost impossible, actually. Dagger, because it generates code, allows you to actually step through the dependency injection, and it's extremely straightforward. So you'll be walking through actual code that you probably would have written uh, if you were doing dependency injection by hand, you can step through the code and you can see where the dependencies are coming from and how they're being resolved and what methods are being called because it's just Java code, no reflection. If you are interested in Dagger, and I hope you are, uh, we have a fairly nice looking website with a bunch of examples and documentation, links to the code, uh, and of course, downloads. It is available here, and with that, I would love to take your questions. Uh, yes. Desktop applications. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Dagger is not an Android library. It is a Java library written with Android in mind. Uh, so it, it's certainly, oh, sorry. Did a horrible thing and didn't repeat the question. Uh, would you suggest Dagger for uh, desktop applications? So um, we are currently not using it. We're only using it for our Android applications. Uh, however, I know that uh, Google, who is also a, a fairly large contributor to Dagger, uh, they are using it for server stuff as well as Android applications. So it implements um, the JSR 330, what I mentioned, the annotations. So um, it's it's uh, not exactly a swap for Juice, uh, but the, the functionality and stuff is a subset of Juice. Uh, so it, it certainly would work in any server or desktop environment. Yes? Yeah. Um, so Dagger and ProGuard. Um, Dagger is currently not ProGuard safe. Uh, it requires you to not obfuscate your classes because it, uh, it uses the 
fully qualified class name of your classes as uh, a key internally, as a string, because like I said, Dagger is basically just a map. Uh, so if you obfuscate your classes, obviously the key is going to be, the generated key is going to be different from the class at runtime. So, uh, right, the current best thing to do would be to not obfuscate anything that has a Dagger annotation on it. Uh, however, we are working to make Dagger ProGuard safe. Uh, and that basically would require, rather than uh, when we statically generate the, um, the uh, they're called module adapters, when we statically generate the module adapters, rather than embedding the fully, quali fully qualified class name as a string, uh, we'll just embed the, um, a reference to the class and then call get, get name on it. Uh, so that's not, there's, there's actually a version that's going to be released, I think, tomorrow or maybe today, depending on what day it is in the United States. Uh, but that does not include ProGuard. The next version that we're working on, uh, 1.3, should be ProGuard safe. Any other questions? I'm finding it hard to see high up, so... I'm going to say no. So, yes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see a couple hands now. Uh, no, it has, so Juice, do, I, do we have our, uh, our own annotations or do we use the Java x.inject ones? Uh, so Juice offers both uh, the Java x.inject annotations and its own annotations. They're interchangeable. Uh, Dagger uses only the Java x.inject ones. So those are the ones that come from JSR 330 itself. There are additional annotations that are provided by Dagger. So Module is obviously one that's uh, Dagger specific not inside JSR 330. Um, and there's also a few additional uh, injection um, helpers that are, are Dagger specific. So there's something called Lazy, uh, which works similar to a provider, if you're familiar with the concept. Um, things that are things, a few things that are Dagger specific. But for everything that we can, we do use the javax.inject stuff. Uh, Anybody else? I can't, yeah, somewhere? Yeah? Is Dagger the successor of Juice? Uh, I would say no. Uh, Dagger cannot fulfill all of the things that uh, Juice can do, especially in a server environment. Um, there's for instance, anything that's dynamically bound, uh, dynamic bindings, uh, because Dagger does everything at compile time, all of the work at compile time, it's very hard to do anything dynamically. Things like uh, assisted injection, and there's a bunch of other things that Juice provides because it's all reflection-based and because it can do things like uh, it leverages AOP for rewriting your classes and stuff. Because it can do all that stuff, there's, there's things that Dagger is never going to be able to do. Uh, and because server applications traditionally start once and run for, not forever, but for, you know, hopefully forever, uh, the, the cost of that slow initialization uh, is, becomes moot. And the fact that it does injection slow, it's not really slow when you're running on, you know, a big beefy server. Um, so I don't, I don't want to say that uh, it's a successor. It's inspired by, and uh, it can replace Juice in a few cases, but not all. Uh, and if you've seen, I think uh, Juice version 4 just had their first release candidate a couple weeks ago. So it's still undergoing very active development there as well. I think that might be it. Speak up if you have your hand up. All right. I would not be allowed to come. If I didn't plug Square really quickly, we are hiring, of course. If you are interested, this is the website. I would love to work with you. Uh, and thank you for your time. <laughs>